Good morning and welcome to Bates Botanical Boot Camp. Today we are talking about growing, growing, gone, dealing with houseplant failure, which can always be sad. It makes you maybe not want to try that houseplant again. But I would say a lot of houseplant is a learning curve, um, trial by error. I've killed a lot of my houseplants um, and learned, you know, how to take care of them and done better the next time around. So today we're going to talk about troubleshooting problems that could be um, problems that could be happening with your houseplant right now or something that could be happening in the future. Uh, we'll kind of cover pretty common problems and we will open for a Q&A at the end. But as always throughout the webinar, if you have any questions at all pertaining to what I'm talking to, <laughs> Tyler's zooming in. Um, feel free to write them in the chat box on Zoom. If you're watching on Facebook, you can write in the comment section. And Tyler, who is our tech man, who will appear in a little magical box, um, will feed me those questions. So let's get started. Like I said, new plants are a learning curve. Um, if you're new to house plants, it's going to be a bigger learning curve. And know that not all house plants are equal in care. A lot of people will come into the nursery and just pick out a plant and just be like, okay, I water this once a week. It needs sun, I guess, because it's a plant. But in reality, just about every single variety, genus, species, what have you, is going to have a different set of care um, for that particular plant. So studying that plan or, you know, go to your local garden center or even just Google it. There's a lot of opinions out there, but there's a lot of good information. Um, so you want to study up on a new houseplant before you get it. Now, if you're, you know, pretty used to houseplants, you have quite a few, but you bring in a new one, it's still going to be a little bit of a learning curve. I know last year I bought a new houseplant and I killed it right away. So learned about that and I've been doing houseplants for quite a while. The biggest failure I would say when it comes to houseplant care is overwatering and overloving. A lot of my houseplants seem to thrive on neglect. Um, underwatering is always easier to come back from overwatering. So we will talk about that issue as we move further into the webinar. An initial placement for your plant. And I had a webinar about a year ago on that, um, choosing the right houseplant for your space. When we talk about lighting, we talk about how often you're going to water, if you're going to fertilize, if you're going to be gone and you need a houseplant that can just, you know, hang out on its own without a friend, without watering. So that, those are things to think about um, before you dive into shopping for a new houseplant. So troubleshooting, these are the things we're going to talk about as far as troubleshooting goes today acclimating your new house plant or your old house plant. We'll talk about seasonal change, bringing a house plant into a new space or moving that house plant into a new spot. Lighting is going to, going to be our next topic. Um, you know, the sun that that house plant is getting, how to know if it's medium light, high light, what have you. Watering, I would say that is the biggest issue when it comes to house plants. We will break that down and talk about signs that you are over or under watering. Pests, which most house plants in their life as much as I hate to say it, will probably get some type of pest on the leaves, on the stems, or in the soil. And it doesn't mean your plant is gone. We will talk about how to find those pests and then how to treat those pests. Fungal and viral um, problems with your leaves and your plant, we will touch on that, and fertilization. So yay, let's dive on in. I'm going to take a sip of my coffee because I feel like I've already been talking a lot. Are you also going to go over what wine selection uh, to, to cope with uh, green <laughs> yes. bean plants? We will also talk about the types of wine you want to be drinking, depending on what is happening with that house plant. Because it is hard to cope with losing a plant. I know that um, I have a few sad plant stories, but I got a cactus at an estate sale probably about 10 years ago that I rescued. Um, it had been a cactus grower and had all these greenhouses, but you could tell they had been um, decommissioned for, I would say at least a decade, but I found one cactus out of hundreds of pots that was still growing. I brought it home, I babied it, I had it for about eight years, and sometimes they just will get some kind of fungal infection and it got that and it died so quickly. And that heartache of losing that cactus that was growing, growing, and then gone, pretty hard to cope with. But, you know, if you have a plant friend, you have a glass of wine or a cup of tea, it always makes things a little bit easier. So we're going to start by talking about leaves. Those are probably going to be the biggest indicator of a problem with your plant. They will usually let you know if they have some kind of issue, if they're ailing, 
with their with their leaves or spots will show up. You'll know or should before your plant dies as long as you're keeping an eye on that little house plant. So yellowing leaves, I would say, is one of the biggest issues I see. And I have a lot of people that come in, especially with ficus. Um, you know, a lot of plants will shed their old leaves. They'll turn yellow. So the leaves that are older, that are closer to the base, if it's a ficus, they're going to be closer into the branches. Down lower, um, if it's an alocasia, it's going to be the outer leaves. Now, they will naturally shed. And usually they will turn yellow, and then you can pull them off. With yellowing leaves, you always want to remove them from the plant, or if they fall into the pot, you'll want to clean that out and remove it. Now, if those leaves are starting to yellow at the new growth or starting to spread really quickly, that's going to be a sign that the plant is not happy. Usually it's going to be overwatering. Mmm, so fun. Um, the plant could be too cold. So I know in the winter I have to move in a lot of my house plants from the window because even though they're in my house, which is getting heated, they're still getting that cold draft coming in from the window. And those leaves will start to yellow as they get stressed and as they, you know, eventually shed and die. And then it could be root bound. So if the plant has been in this pot for too long, um, some plants can be in a pot, I would say for eight years. I've had some cacti in pots for a long time. Some plants need to be repotted like every two years or so. But it will show signs of being root bound. Yellowing leaves is a sure sign that it might be root bound. Um, sure sign might be, but you know what I'm trying to say. It just can't get enough nutrients out because those roots are, they've basically absorbed all the nutrients in the soil and you'll have to be fertilizing more often. So moving on from yellowing leaves, we're going to talk about crispy leaves. Now, I wish we had a live audience because I would say, what does crispy leaves sound like? Tyler, what does crispy leaves sound like? Crunch. Put Oh, that's exactly, they sound crunchy, but it means that they're not getting enough water, they're getting too much light, and they're drying out the leaves. So too much sun, too hot, it could also be you're over-fertilizing. So people think, you know, I'm going to get some fertilizer, I'm going to fertilize my plant every day or once a week. That can do a lot more damage than actually under-fertilizing. So leaf burn is a sure sign of over-fertilization. Or if you're treating your plant with a pesticide, if it's gotten a nasty little pest, which again, we will talk on later, that could be a sure sign of those crispy leaves and also low humidity, especially in the winter. If you've got calathea, which I love and I have a lot um, on this table today, they like a lot of humidity. So in the winter, when you have your heat on, um, especially if you have like propane or gas heat, which I have, it just dries the air out. It pulls all the humidity out of the air, thus causing those leaves to get crispy on the edges. So I usually keep a humidifier in. So we've talked about yellowing leaves. We've talked about crispy leaves. And now we're going to talk about spots on your leaves. This is probably the most fun one. So... I see it a lot in ficus. I see it with pothos. I mean, any plant can have it, but you'll start to see these spots. I don't have any plants in here with the spots on the leaves, but they'll kind of form in random spots on the leaf itself. Usually with this, it's going to be a fungal infection that's caused from overwatering, from the plant staying too moist and also watering the leaves with a lot of things. I'm going to talk about ficus a lot because that's one of the most popular house plants, but I would say one of the most problematic plants. People think that their leaves want to be watered all the time. They don't. That's going to cause fungal infections in the plant. It's going to cause those spots that's going to spread. So what you're going to need to do if you start to see fungal spots on your plants or water spots is to start removing those leaves. There's no coming back from those spots. It's not going to heal and it's not going to be a beautiful leaf again. But it's time to shed that old leaf off. And it's actually good to um, take off old leaves and even prune your plant. It's going to promote new growth, new healthy growth. Um, and we will talk about that a little bit later. I was going to move on, but it's not time yet. So we've talked about those three leaf problems. Another big problem that we will talk about um, a little bit later is root rot, which root rot will kind of show signs um, through leaf spot. That's a good sign through fungus gnats and through the plant just wilting and kind of staying wilted. So do we have any questions yet, Tyler? No questions, but, but feel free There's Tyler. to type them in the chat or comment them on Facebook if you're watching out there. We're Thanks ready for joining for us today. 
Also, I hope everyone's staying nice and cool outside because it is hot right now here in Middle Tennessee. Okay, so we're going to go through the troubleshooting bullet points that I mentioned earlier in the webinar. So acclimating your plant. If you've bought a new plant at a nursery, some plants are more prone to stress when you bring them into a new environment, but all plants are going to be slightly stressed when you take them from a greenhouse in a nursery or out on a lot. If it's a house plant that's been moved outside in the spring and summer, you bring it in, you put it in a new place, it's getting different lighting, different temperatures, and the watering schedule is probably going to be very different. So naturally, your plant might look a little bit stressed and sometimes maybe for three months. Um, if it is a tree, specifically ficus, they tend to drop their leaves a little bit. That's going to be the older leaves that will start to shed off. Now remove those leaves like I talked about earlier. You don't want to leave that dead debris sitting around your plant because it's going to attract pests and fungal infections with that house plant. So that is pretty normal as your plant acclimates also, seasonally, your plant will um, go through periods where it does want to go dormant. Now, there's a lot of forums online as far as houseplants go and whether or not you should fertilize your houseplant in the winter. I don't fertilize my houseplants in the winter. And it is a matter of preference, but I find that most of my houseplants do pretty much go dormant in the winter. Even if I don't put them outside in the spring and summer, they know the days are shorter it's colder outside. Even if your heat's on, they feel that seasonal change. So a lot of my plants will either completely go dormant and look dead, which they're not. They come back um, like early summer or they're just not growing a lot. So know that your plant year round more than likely will not be actively growing and looking really healthy. Like I talked about earlier, if you have a calathea, they like a lot of humidity. So in the winter, I mean... <laughs> I've had to cut some completely back that looked dead, but now they look absolutely gorgeous. And with some of my plants, my Audrey ficus, every winter I will um, take all the leaves off and then it just looks like a stick. I do it towards the end of, end of winter. And then when I stick it outside in the spring, once it warms up enough for it not to damage the plant, it pushes beautiful new leaves that were larger than last year's. Um, and that's something that I recommend if you move your plants in and out. As you move them outside, obviously they're going to be getting more sun, especially if they're not on under a covered porch or a canopy or a tree. And they will leaf burn pretty quickly if you don't acclimate them, which can take some time. So with all of my plants that I have and I move a lot of them outside, I'm kind of a fan of sticking like my philodendron, my lickety split. I just stuck it right out in the sun. I let it get sunburnt. I cut off all of those leaves all the way to the base and it reflushed and it looks twice as big as it did last year. And it's just amazing. So that is an option. Um, but once your leaves get leaf burn, there's no coming back from that. They're not going to reflush um, or, you know, What's the word I'm looking for? Heal. Heal over and look as good as new. So, Damage is damage. Damage, damage is, is damage. Done. The damage is done. Um, growing, growing, gone. Yes. Yes. Debbie on Facebook, what causes browning on the leaf tips? On the leaf tips. Mm -hmm. So browning on the leaf tips, like I talked about earlier, is usually if it's a little bit dry, if it's crispy, it's going to be a sign of underwatering, too much light, um, pesticide damage. But if it's kind of soft and mushy, it could be overwatering. Now on the leaf tips, normally that's a sign coming from the roots of under overwatering. Now if it's browning on the inside of the leaves or towards the vein, that could be some kind of fungal infection. It could be a pest that's on your plant. Um, and it even could be some kind of pathogen. And I will go over pest damage and what to look for with those a little bit later. Um, but I think that's as far as acclimating your plant, I think that's all we're going to touch on right now. So if you have any questions on that, again, feel free to put them in the comment box. Um, I do have a webinar on acclimating your house plants for summer and then acclimating your house plants for winter on our Bates Botanical Boot Camp um, tab on our website. So next we're going to talk about watering. Yes, watering. Like I said, this is probably the biggest mistake people make um, who are new to houseplants or new to a specific kind of houseplant. 
I always suggest underwatering as opposed to overwatering. It is so much easier to come back from underwatering. With most plants, there are a few exceptions like the Hartley fern and the ray fern that will just die immediately if they get too dry. But if you overwater, it's going to cause root rot. And because that's in the base of the plant, in the pot, which you can't see the roots unless you've got a clear pot, you know, something you can see through or you pull your plant out of the pot every day, which I do not recommend. They don't like to be disturbed like that. Sometimes it's hard to know you have root rot until it's almost too late. So you'll want to start looking for those signs, which as I talked about, it could be leaf spot. Some plants will start to get rotten down towards the base. So on this beautiful skindapsis that we have right now that I bought two of, you'll start to see rot um, kind of where the stem of the plant meets the soil line. It'll rot out. This happens a lot with cactus as well, um, which is a plant that likes to stay really, really dry. So overwatering, if you feel like you've overwatered, you can always take your plant out, let the soil dry out. And I always recommend checking the roots because if they're starting to rot, that rot's gonna spread. So once you pull your plant out of the soil, normally the roots need to be white, a very light tan. Sometimes they're kind of orange or red, which is very exciting and cool. But if you see dark brown or black roots, unless it's a fern, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. That's more than likely going to be root rot. So what I recommend doing is removing all the old soil, cutting off any of that black and even past it. So if you miss it, it won't continue on, but cut into the new roots a little bit. You're not really gonna hurt your plant by cutting the roots. It's actually gonna be a little bit better. And I like to use cinnamon as a fungicide to help stop that root rot. Um, it's organic and it's way cheaper than anything else. Um, you can also buy products at your local nursery online, um, but cinnamon has always done a great, great thing for my plants. It also works as a rooting hormone, which is a fun fact. So you can use that. So with that root rot, you wanna remove it, put your plant in some nice fresh soil, put it back in the pot, and maybe rethink your watering habits. I am not a fan of watering schedules. I help a lot of customers here that say, I need a house plant. I water all of my house plants once a week. There's so many things I could say about that. And it does work for some people, especially if you have plants that um, are very similar in care. But like I mentioned earlier, just about all house plants are going to be different. They're going to grow at different rates. They need more sun, less sun than others. They want more water, less water. So having a watering schedule for your plants across the board probably is not going to be the best. And then having a watering schedule for your specific plant, even if it's one plant for the whole year that you keep the same, that could also be detrimental to your plant. I have to water more in the winter, which seems a little counterintuitive. But like I said, I have gas heat, so it dries out my plants. So sometimes I'm watering plants every other day. And now right now with it being cool in my house, some plants that I was watering a couple times a week, I'm probably watering a couple times a month. Now it could be reversed for you depending on the climate in your house and if you're taking your plants outside, but watering schedules are something that is going to need to be adjust adjusted per seasonal changes. And one really good thing that you can use to test your soil to see if it needs water is your finger. So I suggest sticking your finger in the top inch of soil, depending on your plant's need, make sure at least top inch of soil is dry, especially for leafy plants, pothos. Calathea can take a little bit more water. Um, and then that's a good rule of thumb to water. Now, when it comes to cacti succulent, obviously you're gonna wanna let those plants dry out a little bit more. So we've talked about underwatering and we've also talked about watering schedules. Sorry, we talked about overwatering and watering schedules. So now we're going to talk about underwatering. But first, we're going to talk about this question yes. that Carol has asked. How do you remove the leaves? So The what? I can't hear you over the AC. How do you remove the leaves? Oh, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. So when you remove the leaves, especially for like a leafy plant, I always take it all the way back to the stem. So instead of just taking the leaf... Here, I would take it back, basically on this pothos, back to the node. Let's see, I'll tilt it a little bit more. So if this leaf was damaged, I would clip it all the way back here. Now with ficus um, or, you know, any kind of tree that you have inside, which 
Fortunately, I don't have any in here today. When you remove that leaf, you'll want to remove it very close or right at the stem where that leaf meets the woody part of the plant. And sometimes in removing that leaf, it will cause the plant to push energy into that damaged spot and you'll have a new growth point. You might even get a new branch, usually not a new leaf. A new branch will happen. And if you want to branch out your ficus um, or if you, you know, if your pothos is trailing too much, if you want to cut it back and have it be a little bit bushier, you can actually just notch it or take that whole stem all the way off. And then you will have a new growth point where with like a pothos, it'll grow out probably two, uh, two new vines will push out. With the ficus, you'll get a new branch. Um, I'm not sure when the date is. I think it's at the end of this month. I do have a webinar called Meet Me in My Trailer, The Joy of Trailing Houseplants, where we will talk a little bit more about um, propagating uh, trailing plants. But when it comes to leaf removal, I usually suggest removing it either all the way down to the stem of the plant, or if it's a plant like this calathea that comes from the soil line, I will remove that leaf all the way down to the base. Now, one thing you'll wanna watch with some plants, and it's different for everything, if it's a philodendron, a lot of the time um, they will push their new leaf kind of from the old leaf. So the old leaf will be here, the new leaf will push out a little higher. So if you go to remove that leaf that's the newest one that has pushed out, you'll wanna check and make sure you see where that newer leaf is about to press up and take that leaf right above. But if you have a specific plant, which I could have asked earlier that um, you're wondering about, feel free feel free to put it in the comment box and I can answer that question specifically. Tyler shot a finger gun over there. <laughs> All right, so talking about underwatering, which I am an avid underwaterer and I have found that just about any house plant can bounce back from underwatering with the exception of Hartley fern, which I have probably killed about five of at this point, ray fern, um, and pitcher plants. Those are plants that don't like to really dry out that much. A really fun one to have if you're new to house plants and you're not sure what kind of waterer you are. Spathophyllum, so peace lilies and phytonia are both plants that will start to really, really droop. They look sad, they look like they're weeping. And then once you water them within the hour or two, they'll flush back up and look alive again. Um, so with underwatering, if it's a leafy plant, a lot of the time the leaves will curl if they are needing more water. Calathea usually will curl in, pothos will curl out. But if that leaf is curling and you don't have pests, that's a sure sign that your plant is getting a little too thirsty and needs to be watered. Um, and as far as like how to water plants, I know there's a lot of questions that people have about how to water plants and a lot of opinions, but like I said, I'm an underwaterer. So when I go to water most of my house plants, I will let the water run completely through and out of the bottom of the pot. This is good for a number of reasons. It's going to help flush the salts out of your soil, which can happen. And it will also cause leaf damage, which is why it's important to change out your soil from time to time and flush it out. Um, and then root growth. So I have people that come in and they're like, my ficus is dropping leaves. I don't know what's happening. And I'll usually ask, well, how often are you watering? And for a, for a plant that I would say is about seven feet tall and a pot that's about 14 inches across, so a very large plant, they'll say, well, I'm watering it one liter once a week, which is not nearly enough. So 14 inches across would be about this round. And if you're just watering at one liter, that's not enough water to get to the base of the plant where a lot of the new roots are starting to grow. So in doing that, it's gonna cause shallow root growth because the only part of the plant that's getting moisture is gonna be maybe the top inch, if that. So the roots are going to try to grow primarily up top. And also for the new growth, it's not getting water down to the new roots that need that water to absorb up into the new leaf growth so it's going to start dropping its older leaves to conserve energy for um, the new growth and for just staying alive. So with a lot of plants, water them all the way through. Ficus in particular, they like to stay dry in between waterings. I let mine dry out completely, almost to where the soil is pulling from the edge of the pot, and then I will completely soak it. 
And if anyone has questions about watering, now's the time. Or you can ask later. But I'm going to take this chance to take a sip of my coffee. I've just been posting some links, uh, if you're on Zoom, to some webinars that Caroline's done. Uh, I can also do that to Facebook in a minute. All right. We're going to move on to lighting. So lighting can be pretty tricky um, if you're not used to plants and where to put them in your house. A couple keys to look for is when the sun is coming through that room. Do you have eastern sun? Do you have western sun? Is your window north facing and only gets indirect sun throughout the day, which honestly can be a little bit ideal. I have a lot of my house plants in north facing windows and they are thriving. So before you go to your local nursery or, you know, ordering a plant online or just researching what you know, particular plant you want to get, you'll want to look at the spot where you're going to put it and what kind of lighting it's getting. So plants usually are categorized into three um, categories, low light, medium light, and high light. So with that low light, and I've seen it said online, this could be little to no light. All plants need sunlight, whether it's, you know, like a grow light or from the real sun, it's going to need something to stay alive. So low light plants that do really well that I would recommend, um, Spathophyllum, Sansevieria, Dracaena, Calathea can actually do pretty well in low light. And so those are plants that are going to be, you know, maybe on the same wall as a window, so they're not getting any direct light, but there is some light bouncing off of the walls to where it is receiving a little bit of sunlight. Now, medium light, it doesn't have to be direct sunlight. It just needs to be in a brightly lit room. So if you have a room that, say, is western facing um, and the sun's coming through, it doesn't need to be near the window or even across from it. But as long as that room is staying bright throughout the day, that should be happy. And then highlight are going to be plants that do want some direct sunlight. I would say, I mean, obviously cacti is going to be the highest light plant. You would think that succulents are going to be super high light, but honestly, if you put them in a lot of direct hot sunlight, they're going to burn. They're going to get really stressed. What's cool, a lot of them will turn red at first, which is nice, but that's showing that they're stressed out and then eventually they'll just be getting too much sun. Um, ficus also really likes direct sunlight. And depends on the one you have, my Audrey and my Altissima, I actually put outside in the spring and summer where they're getting like five hours of direct sunlight, including afternoon sunlight a day, and they are thriving. Um, so with your new house plan, if you bring it home and it looks like it's ailing, it could be lighting, you might just need to move it to a new spot. You can always take photos of your plant, um, of the spots spot it is in and email it to us and we can help diagnose the problem with it and if it is getting enough light um, or too much light. So with the leaf talk that I did a little bit earlier, I did talk about your leaves not getting enough light or getting too much light and what that's going to look like. <clears throat> so for the sake of time, because I always tend to go too long, we're going to go ahead and move into pests unless we have any lighting questions or if Tyler, you have any lighting input. Uh, no, not that I can think of. I mean, you know, small little clip-on uh, grow lights are always great for supplementing light if you're in a situation where you're not getting that much light. And, you know, you're, it's just something you have to factor in if you're living like an apartment that's, you know, open to a, a, an interior courtyard where there's no direct sun. Just got to make those considerations. Um, please, if you have any questions, comment, post. We're, we're here to answer them live. We are. We're here for you. I love answering questions. Um, and I always tell my students that asking questions is going to help everybody. And no question is a stupid question. That's um, right. I answer a ton of questions here at the nursery. And like I said, I mean, house plants or any kind of plant, plants on the lot, trees, shrubs, perennials, if you're new to it, like you should be asking questions. Every single plant is different care is different. Your yard's going to be different than your neighbor's yard. Your house is going to be different than your neighbor's house. Ask away. That's what we're here for. Is anthurium a good house plant? Anthurium. And, and a good, strong soil, please. Yes. Anthurium is a great house plant. Um, 
I, you're probably talking about like the standard anthurium that have the little saucer blooms um, with the little spath that comes out. Those are great house plants. Um, I just put mine in like a regular indoor soil mix. I usually add a little bit of perlite just to help with drainage. But they like, I would say medium light. I have a black anthurium that I absolutely love. And I would say they're easy. Um, they don't like to dry out too much in between watering. So you'll, like I mentioned, letting the top like half inch to inch soil dry and then flushing it out. Um, but yeah, they're great house plants. And there's a lot of different varieties. We have a cool one called Big Red Bird here at the nursery that's huge and has like bird-like stems and these giant leaves and of course, I bought one as soon as they came in because they're so cool. And that's probably my favorite anthurium, at least that I own right now, other than my black anthurium, which is very gothy. And I like her a lot. Um, but yeah, great houseplant. So we're going to move to talking about pests. Mm, so fun. I've, oh, you missed the other thing. A good soil. Oh, a good. Good, strong soil. Right. Indoor soil mix. And I mix a little bit of perlite. So I use our earth mix that we sell here at Bates Nursery. And I actually have this banner behind me. Um, before I started working here at the nursery, I had only used the garden blend for my like raised beds. And then I didn't even realize we had an indoor soil mix. And I have started using that. I switched to that. I actually have a photo on um, one of the Instagram pages that I manage the at home show, which is a great plant topic show, garden show that Tyler and I are on every Saturday morning that airs live from the nursery, from the green room actually here. You can answer or ask all your plant questions and we will answer them. Um, but I did put a photo up of a big box store indoor soil mix compared to the earth mix Proganics I and the amount of growth in that plant that was in the earth mix is, I mean, it's insane how much happier the plant is. And it was the same plant purchased at the same time. And I just did an experiment to see, because I like to, you know, I like to know my soils, my house plants are so close to my heart, even though I have so many of them and I want to take good care of them. Um, but that's a great soil mix. If you don't have it, if you're, you're not from here, I know there's a couple places around like the southeast that have it um, but just you could you really use any kind of indoor potting mix it would be happy with that earth earthmix.net if you want to find a, a a carrier of earth mix which would be a local garden center in like middle tennessee or also even some places in indiana and kentucky uh give it a shot i just ate a piece of ice oh <laughs> old of you i know right it's so, so hot you got to stay cool somehow y'all it is so hot here at the nursery but we're still open and selling plants and answering questions okay so moving on to pests this is probably the most annoying thing about house plants and even if you don't bring a pest home on your new plant you could be in someone else's house it could attach itself to your clothes it can come in you could just get it from being outdoors i mean a lot of well all you know houseplant pests are also affecting plants that are outside. So they can come in at any time, but I always suggest when you buy a new plant, well, before you buy it, you inspect to make sure it's pest free. A lot of nurseries um, are high volume, especially right now. Plants have been so popular and the supplier, sometimes they'll ship plants that do have like a slight infestation. So sometimes at any nursery, you know, Lowe's, Home Depot, anywhere, you could have a pest on that plant. So you'll want to check it. Usually I suggest, or what I'll do is look at the underside of the leaf and make sure it's pretty clear. You want to look for little white dots, webbing, um, these tiny little barnacle things, they're called scale, or little tiny black or white bugs that are moving quickly. And I will, I will talk about what each and every one of these are. So first off, check the underside of the leaves. I mean, if it's a bad infestation, it's gonna be on the top of the leaf. Pests also like to get in at any little crevice. So I would check, you know, where the leaf meets the stem and then just look on the soil line and in the new growth. Because a lot of pests love that tender new growth. They'll just, especially aphids, get all over it. So that's the first key. When you're going to get your new house plant before you buy it, check it for pests. And then I, I don't do it because I don't have the space because I have so many plants, but I do know a lot of plant people that will quarantine their new plants for about two to three weeks. 
So if you have the space to when you take that new plant home to put it in a separate room where it's away from all your other plants, in the event that you've brought something home that wasn't fully infested yet or you missed, so it does not spread to your other plants. Now, usually once I get home, I will just kind of clean the plant, wipe the leaves down top and bottom. And what I suggest using is a microfiber cloth. And if you're just cleaning the leaves for like, you know, water spots from watering on the leaves or something, you can just use uh, that microfiber cloth with water. You can also use neem oil. Um, it's going to help shine the leaves, but it'll also help kind of remove any pests that might be there that you didn't see. So the pests that you'll want to look for, I would say the most... Um, the most popular pest when it comes to houseplants, at least here, mealybugs. Um, they look like if cotton candy was all white and miniature, that's what mealybugs look like to me, or at least they're, you know, like their nest where they're really taken over. And they'll, like the single mealybugs, when they get really big, they're pretty nasty. Um, it looks like something that you'd see in the ocean, kind of. They're going to be white. Uh, they look like a flat roly-poly that's white. And then they'll have like a little nest that's really cottony. Now you can remove these with a cotton swab. You can dip it in rubbing alcohol. If you're worried about hurting your plant, you can also dilute it. And then just wipe that leaf off. The rubbing alcohol will kill, kill the mealy bugs on contact. And then I suggest getting, you can do neem oil, you can do um, insecticidal soap, you can use Dawn dish soap, peroxide. People use a number of household items to kind of spray your plant down. Now with this, it doesn't necessarily treat the problem. It's just going to kill the bugs on contact that are getting hit by that. Um, so you might need to re retreat every so often. And I will talk about more treatments once I get through my, my bug pest uh, spiel. So mealybugs is a big one. And I would say next to mealybugs is gonna be spider mites. These are a little bit harder to see. Sometimes you won't see them until there's actual damage on the leaves because they're feeding off of the juices in your leaves. Your leaves will start to turn yellow and it's a different kind of yellow than over underwatering, low fertilization, high fertilization and lighting. It's gonna be a different look. Um, a lot of the time, like it'll be on one leaf or sporadically on a few because they tend to just stick to one and really, you know, it's like a party for them on that leaf. They're going to hang out and party with all their friends while they're just sucking those juices out of your plant. Um, but instead of being on the edges or being like a spot that we talked about with the fungal disease, it's going to be more sporadically around the leaf and it's going to start slowly turning yellow. I find that it's slow to start and then very quickly just whoosh, sucks the life out of that leaf. So that could be spider mites, um, could also be thrips or a number of things. But spider mites will present themselves in a lot of leaf damage and you'll see tiny, tiny little white-ish spidery looking things. They're almost microscopic, so they're really hard to see, but they'll eventually have webbing on the, usually the underside of your leaf with little bitty dots. This can be treated the same way. You can wipe it down, um, neem oil, rubbing alcohol, remove it, spray your plant down and just keep on checking. The next one is going to be scale. If I got anything on my house plant, I think I prefer scale. I've seen some giant scale before that was real gross that was like this big around um they can get pretty nasty. no way yes it oh. it was i'm not kidding and i don't i got so grossed out that i didn't take a photo or video and i should have but it came in from a monstera we got in last year and i always inspect our plants when we get our plant shipment in each week and it was i unwrapped this uh monstera and i was like what is that there's like a giant dot on it and it was the biggest scale i didn't even know scale got that big i mean Ooh. it really it looked like a barnacle it looked like one of those things that are attached to rocks so mm -hmm. maybe not a barnacle but those prehistoric looking things that you find in the creeks here under the rocks mm -hmm. do you know what they mm -hmm. are tyler no okay we're going into <laughs> a water uh water webinar so we're going to Go back to our pest. So scale, they're kind of hard bodied. Uh, mealy bugs are a type of scale, but they're more soft. So scale, it's like they have an armor. Like if an armadillo was a pest on a plant, I feel like it would be scale. They're easy to treat, at least I think. I will usually just take that rubbing alcohol on a Q-tip or a microfiber cloth and just wipe them off. Um, that usually will remove them. 
Then you can, same thing, you can spray it down with neem oil in case you missed anything. So it's going to kill those plants um, with that application. But again, it doesn't control it. So if there's babies coming out, if something's hatching, you're going to have to keep on retreating. But mealybug, spider mite, and scale, I would say, are the top three pests that you'll have to be on the lookout for. Um, and then I'm going to talk about a few others. Aphids, which this time of year, they're rampant. They love, they love tropical hibiscus. Mm, they love them. They love that new growth on the plant. Um, if you've got aphids where your new leaves are coming out or your plant's about to bloom, you'll notice all these little tiny bugs. Sometimes they're red, sometimes they're green, white, black. They're all different colors, but they will cluster on the new growth. If you miss them clustering, sometimes you'll find little skeletons from where they've hatched, like on the underside of your leaves, which is cool in a way, but we just don't want pests on our plants. The way I usually treat aphids, which is kind of fun, I'll basically, I'll just spray them off. So I'll um, get like a little bit of a low pressure or high pressure, depending on what plant I'm treating. With cactus, I've gotten scale on it before, and I've used the same thing with higher pressure, but I will turn my plant down and then spray like from the base of the plant up so I'm not spraying directly onto the plant damaging it but I'm spraying through and that's just gonna like blast those aphids off and that's really all I usually do to treat aphids I don't deal with them on my house plants too often but you can spray them off you can do that in the shower and then take that microfiber cloth wipe it down with neem oil um, and again keep your eyes peeled for more uh more infestations. And then my least favorite, thrips. They are evil and I'm not gonna say it because I don't wanna bring them into my house, but they, I would say, are the most common houseplant pests that you don't see until there's a lot of damage. They're almost impossible to see um, when they're not mature. And then when they're older, your plant usually already has some damage. They're on the underside of the leaves. They're, when you put them under a microscope, they're so nasty. They're so gross. Tyler could possibly pull up a photo of them. I mean, you can also Google and look up thrips. Uh, I posted the common houseplant pest webinar, which I believe we looked at thrips. Yes. If not, I could. We, I think we pull up photos in the common houseplant pest. So we don't, I mean, people can, people can Google or go to our yeah. old webinars. Um, but they're, they can be white. They can be black. But they're these little long bugs that are kind of squirmy and they move really, really fast. Um, I will usually try to treat them with neem oil, insecticidal soap. But if I encounter thrips, I'll usually move to something a little more substantial like spinosad or uh, pyrethrin that's going to kill them and kind of help control that for a little while longer. And again, I'll go over these treatments that you can use for pests once I get through listing them. We have just a couple more. Um, Whitefly, again, something I don't see that often. They tend to love Ficus benjamina. I found it on that. I know they really love poinsettias, um, but you'll find their eggs on the underside of the leaves. They quickly hatch and they're, they literally are just like these white flies that once you disturb the plant, they'll, they'll just fly everywhere. And then fungus gnats. So fungus gnats are a fun one because if you've got fungus gnats, 99% sure that you are overwatering your plant because fungus gnats do not thrive in a dry soil environment. So if you start to have fungus gnats, check your soil, check your watering habits, and I suggest changing your soil out. Now there is a soil brand within the last year that has been carrying a lot of fungus gnats in it I've had people come in and they're like, I just repotted this plant. It was doing so good. And now there's all these little bugs. And then I'll usually ask them, what's the brand of the soil that you're using for that plant? And most of the time, it's this particular brand. Um, so you'll want to really research where you get your soil um, and where they source their ingredients for it. Uh, the Earth Mix Proganics I, which I talked about earlier, uses coconut core as opposed, as opposed to peat moss, which is better for the environment, and it's less susceptible to uh, fungus gnats. So do your research with that, but again, I suggest changing out the soil. If you just replanted it, you've got fungus gnats. If you can afford it, you know, and if you can go to the store, I suggest just tossing that soil that you had in that bag, not reusing it for that plant, getting some nice, fresh, 
clean soil to repot it. If it's really bad, you can flush your roots with like a hydrogen peroxide mix. And if you don't want to change the soil out, you can also do that hydrogen peroxide mix um, to flush the soil out if you want to try that first. There's sticky traps that people get. Um, I mean, that's going to work trap, trapping some of those fungus gnats, but it can be pretty tricky to get rid of when you get it. Um, but again, it's a sign of overwatering. So go ahead and adjust your watering schedule and hopefully that will cure it. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about uh, chemicals, soaps, what have you that you can use to treat these. So I've already talked about neem oil, insecticidal soap, and um, kind of DIY home treatments that you can use, Dawn dish soap, peroxide. So these are all going to be things that are going to treat on contact. They're not going to control it. But neem oil and insecticidal soap that you get at the store is uh, non-toxic. It's, I believe, I believe it's organic. Um, so it's going to be a little bit better for you, better for your pets, and better for the bees if your plant is outside. So I always suggest starting with something that's non-toxic because you might be able to go ahead and completely eradicate that pest with that before you move on to harsher um, pesticides or insecticides. So if that's not working for you, you can go with a pyrethrin, spinosad. They're more... Um, insecticide. They're still naturally derived, but they're going to be toxic. So if you have pets, if you have children, or if you like to put your face close to your plant, um, you'll want to go ahead and put that plant out of reach for a couple weeks while it does its work. Now, some of them say they're supposed to control um, infestations for a few weeks, but I sometimes, if I've got a bad infestation, I'll supplement with still cleaning my leaves. Um, while I'm treating that. So, and that, those are the chemicals that you will look for. Uh, the product will have a different name. I think here we have one that's called Eight, and we have Captain Jack's, which I think is Spinosad, or it's a Captain Jack's brand. Um, but your local garden center will be able to help you, or if you, you know, type in those things, it'll come, the product list will come up. And then if, you know, nothing is working for your plant, but you're still not ready to give up on it, um, you can go with something systemic. So that means you're going to treat the soil in your plant, basically, with this uh, product. When you water it, the plant absorbs it like it does when you fertilize those nutrients in the soil. It's going to absorb this treatment go into the leaves into the stems and when these pests are feeding on your plant it's going to poison those pests now it doesn't harm your plant but it's not good for bees and like i said if you have pets and if you go at the systemic treatment if it's a non-toxic plant it is now a toxic plant so you will probably have to move where it is if your cat likes to nibble on it or your dog you know is a snacker on your house plants uh, you'll want to put it up and this can take you know it could take upwards of a month to start working because that plant, like I said, has to absorb it. Those pests have to feed on it and then they're poisoned by it. Um, so those are usually the three things I recommend in order of, you know, going from natural, organic, non-toxic to making your plant highly toxic to where it's going to kill anything it eats. Uh, what, what ratio hydrogen peroxide to water? Seriously? I usually do one to one. And with that, when you flush it out, it also kind of helps flush the salts out of the soil. Stuff will build up over time in your soil. Um, and like I touched on when I talked about watering earlier, when you water all the way through, it helps just flush that, um, that soil out. And then uh, we kind of talked about fungal infections when we talked about watering. And so those are going to be like leaf spots. So they're usually yellow. Sometimes they have a black edge. Sometimes they're black but they'll appear like in the inside of leaves. Sometimes on the edging, I mean, some plants will get kind of a fungal type thing and it can appear in many different forms. I've seen so many wild things here at the nursery. It's insane. Um, but if you start to get fungal spots, that's usually from when you water, watering the leaves or it's staying too wet. So sometimes you have fungal spots and fungus gnats, they'll go hand in hand. And you'll want to remove any damaged leaves because this is going to start spreading. And you can use a fungicide to treat it. Um, sometimes I'll just remove the leaves and that's enough. Um, but spray it down with neem oil. Neem oil is also a fungicide and it'll help control that from spreading. But you will want to get it away from your other, other plants so it doesn't, doesn't keep on spreading. Um, I feel like I was going to touch on something else with... Treatment products? 
no, not treatment products, but well, I did, I did touch on it with watering, but there, uh, there's a lot of different opinions when it comes to so many things with houseplants, like I said earlier, um, and a lot of people miss their houseplants or think that it's good for them. I have a handful of houseplants. I mean, I have over 200 houseplants and I probably have about 12 that I will mist. Um, misting, especially if you're doing it too often and too heavily, that's going to be a big factor in getting spots on your leaves. Um, when you water, you'll want to water at the base of the plant, not the leaves. Uh, ficus is a big one, especially like the elastica and the Teneki, so the hybridized version of the uh, burgundy, burgundy elastica. That one is really prone to leaf spot, fungal spots, if it gets water on the leaves or too much in the soil. So really watch your leaves. Research your plant. I mean, like I said, some like being misted. My calathea, I don't really mist it. I think you can. They, they like a lot of humidity. My ferns I'll miss, like my staghorn fern, I'll actually soak it. But like my ficus, succulent, pothos, philodendron, I do not mist any of those because that will cause more trouble, at least in my opinion, than it will help the plant. Um, so that was what I wanted to touch on. And the last thing we're going to talk about as far as our troubleshooting points is fertilization. So seems like it'll, it's an easy thing, you know, but it can be a little bit tricky and tricky to know what you're doing. I suggest fertilizing starting at least here in Middle Tennessee. We're zone 7A, 7B. Uh, when our spring starts rolling around and it's getting warmer, like end of March, early April is when I will start fertilizing my houseplants. And depending on the houseplant, some like to be fertilized way more than others. Like uh, my micans likes to be fertilized every other week. Whereas my cacti, you know, I probably just fertilize it once, maybe twice a year because it doesn't need that much. But from spring to summer, I will fertilize. And if you've got a heavy feeder, like the micans that I was talking about that I fertilize every other week, I will usually start fertilizing it with a lower dilution if I'm using, um, I, I use a lot of different fertilizers, but if I'm using like a liquid plant food, I won't, won't be as heavy as I start. And then as I start to pull back from fertilizing or towards the end of the season, I'll start fertilizing a little bit less just so it has time to really grow and then, you know, go to sleep. And what we talked about earlier, I don't fertilize my plants in the winter. I feel like they need that dormancy time to really conserve their energy, rest, you know, think about things they did wrong throughout the year, what they could do to make you happier and maybe not die to where you have to deal with that house plant loss. Um, and the numbers on fertilizer, there's three numbers. Usually, generally, the houseplant uh, number for a lot of liquid houseplant feeders is going to be 10, 10, 10. It's nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium are the three numbers. And depending on whether you want your plant to flower, if you want stronger root growth, if you want uh, greener leaves, bigger leaves, the number will kind of dictate what, um, what kind of fertilizer you need for that. So you can do a little bit of research. I will usually use a slow release fertilizer with most of my house plants, and then I'll supplement it with a liquid fertilizer that I will feed throughout the spring and summer. So I always suggest Osmocote. That's what I use. I started in like late March, early April. It feeds for six months. So if I get lazy and, or I forget to fertilize something, at least it has that slow release fertilizer um, throughout its active growing season. So yeah, Tyler, are there any questions? No questions. I think we're we're approaching the hour, so if you want to just go ahead and Tyler's good at keeping people on track and you know not letting the webinars go for an hour and a half. So we've covered um, things to look for with your ailing house plant if it starts to show signs of stress. Pests love a sick plant. So if your plant is really attracting a lot of pests, it could be that it needs to be repotted, it needs to be fertilized, or you need to change your watering schedule. Um, I find that once I fertilize plants or move them to a new spot, if they had pests, it usually kind of cures it with a little bit of treatment from neem oil or something. So there's a lot of things when it comes to house plants. And like I said, it's trial by error. I've learned so much by getting new plants and quickly watching them die or slowly watching them die. But they will show signs of stress and just watch your plant for that. I mean, check the leaves, use that microfiber cloth to clean the leaves off. Even if you don't have pests, it'll give you time to kind of check in and see if there's a problem. Because normally pl 
plants will show signs of stress before they just die. Now, I have had some that just keeled over and I didn't know why. And it is very disheartening to lose a house plant, especially if you've had it for a while. But hopefully this gives you some tools that you can take home um, to use in your, <laughs> in your battle for your house plants for their, their love and their glory. Because they're amazing little creatures and I love them. So I guess that wraps it up. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in the comment box. Um, and I guess we'll hang out for a moment to see if any come in. Yeah, we just got someone asking for the spelling of Osmocote. It's O-S-M-O-C-O-T-E. I love Osmocote. It could be that I have a lot of house plants and I can be a little bit lazy sometimes, but I'm like, feed them once a year. I have the done. need, the need for shake and feed. Yes. <laughs> They're just the best. Um, and, you know, you could still dress with an or organic fertilizer. You might want to do it a little bit more frequently uh, as it's just not as potent as Osmocote. But it is, you know, uh, be, be mindful that Osmocote is synthetic and that, you know, that just comes. But, I mean, you're not eating anything from your houseplants. So yeah, we don't eat our house plants normally. I mean, unless you have a citrus tree, that's a little bit different. Uh, one thing that I didn't talk about with fertilizing um, is I recently this year I've started top dressing my house plants. It was kind of an experiment to see how it went. I use the Earth Mix Supernatural compost mix, which is a mixture that Earth Mix makes. Uh, and depending on the plant size, the pot size, I will top dress my house plant like quarter of an inch to I don't know if I've done an inch that's pretty thick just in the top of my soil and I've gotten great results um, and I did that probably in like February so before everything started growing I top dressed it before I fertilized and I love it it was super easy um, and some of mine I've only top dressed I haven't fertilized this year just to kind of see what happens but like we talked about if you're new to house plants um, know that you're going to learn by you know, maybe losing one. But if they show signs of stress, change it up. Change your watering. Give them more light, maybe less light. Call the nursery. Bring in a photo if you have any questions at all. It can be pretty hard to learn your new plant. Um, and all of our houses are different. People ask me all the time, well, how often should I water this? And honestly, it depends on your HVAC system. If you have fans running near it, what temperature you keep your house at, if the room is bright, if the room is not bright. There's a lot of factors that go into it. So just learning your plant, learning your space is the most important. And I guess that wraps it up. Sure does. So thank you everyone for joining us today. I believe next oh, week. How do you feel about earthworm castings for top dressing? I think that's great. Yeah, I think that um, earthworm castings, I believe, is mixed into the supernatural compost mix that I use. Um, so that should be great. I would give it a try. It's a great boost. Great organic boost. It really is. Okay. Now you can wrap it up. Carol. I'm going to wrap it up. <laughs> um, so don't be sad if you lose your house plant. I mean, just buy one, maybe five as a replacement to fill that void that that one left. And you know, it's trial by error. They're growing things. They're living creatures and things are going to go wrong. Things are going to change. They're going to need to be repotted if they're root bound, if they're showing signs of stress. So I hope you enjoyed this little webinar and um, have a great day. Bye.